And when the Nobel Prize for Literature was awarded to Bob Dylan in 2016, the literary world was up in arms. How could the world's most prestigious book prize be awarded to a famously cantankerous singer-songwriter in his 70s who wouldn't even deign to make a victory speech? In his book, however, Why Dylan Matters, Harvard professor Richard F. Thomas answers that question with erudition. A world expert in classical poetry, um, Richard F. Thomas was initially ridiculed by his colleagues for teaching a course on Bob Dylan alongside his traditional seminars on poets such as Homer and Virgil. However, the Nobel Prize win brought him vindication and he immediately found himself thrust into the limelight as a leading academic voice in all matters. Did a a logical, and I hope I said that right, because I'm delighted to be joining me live on the line from Savannah, I believe, uh, author of uh, Why Dylan Matters and and professor in all things Dylan, uh, Richard F. Thomas. Richard, good afternoon to you. Good afternoon, Giles. Good great afternoon. to have you, great to have you with us. What is the technical term? Because I've got it's written in the press notes. Dylanological. Is that? Do you think that's correct? Yeah, dylanological would do. So dylanology, I guess, is a, is the term for for what some of us do. Dylanology. I like that. Professor in dylanology. So I mean, Dylan, singer songwriter, folk singer, protest poet. Did he, did he? Obviously, in your opinion, he thinks he deserves the the plaudits he he received from the the Nobel Prize. Yeah, I think so. Um, he's he's the master of the English language in song, um, but song goes way back. Song and poetry are what the Greeks did together, and the and the Romans. We lost the music, but we have the poetry, and uh, can imagine it's being it's being sung in performance. So Dylan is uh, in a good and long tradition of the the Greek word for for lyre is kithara, which is where guitar comes from, the same word. So, yeah, singing to the kithara, singing to the guitar, pretty much the same thing. Where did you what, – what made you draw the link, though, between the the poets of ancient Greece and, the, the you know, the poet of the 60s? Well, the Dylan of the 60s, of the mid-60s in particular, that remarkable um, 15 months or so, uh, 65, 66 – basically expressed in song um, uh, what the Greek lyric poets and the Latin lyric poet Catullus say uh, were expressing about very human, fundamental human things, what it means to be in love, to fall out of love, to um, to have relationships with others which uh, do or don't work uh, in various ways, to have uh, rivalries, to lose, to win, and so on. So Dylan... Dylan's art is something that speaks to all of us. It, do, it says things in ways that we can't say, but which uh, which touch us and matter to us. But you could argue that other six singers, sixty singer songwriters, had were dealing with the same subjects. I mean, Lennon and McCartney were doing the same sort of thing. You could argue that the Rolling Stones were doing the same things. James Taylor. What sets Dylan? Do you think apart? Is it the the naked quality of the voice, or is it the the quality of the the lyrics themselves? I think it's a combination of things. It's the lyrics primarily, the song, but then the person of Bob Dylan, just the look of him. Um, singing the voice, which is a marvelous voice in all of its manifestations. Some people say, well, he, you know, Nashville Skyline was okay, but his voice went to pieces. Uh, he wrote songs that were right for the voice, particularly the songs since 1997, the, the four or five great albums that have come out since then, which are not the Rolling Stones singing songs of young men, but Dylan writing and singing songs of old blues men, people whose whose life is closer to the end than to the beginning. And so, yeah, I think it's the whole person of, of Bob Dylan. Uh, and I liked, I liked other music over the years. Leonard Cohen perhaps comes closest as a songwriter and singer to Dylan, but Neil Young, Joni Mitchell, any number of them. But Dylan, I think, and I think the Nobel Committee recognizes, Dylan is, um, is, the, uh, yeah, is matchless, I think. And you could you can argue you don't ever have to argue the point, but you can draw the line as well to the great American poets and the great folk poets, folk artists such as uh, Woody Guthrie, for example, in the in the twenties and the thirties. Right, and and Dylan, of course, is is fundamentally connected to Guthrie. Though Guthrie came and went at various points, he's now back uh, with Guthrie singing Guthrie. But um, yeah, so I think he's more complex and. Guthrie, I think his his songs, I, I love Guthrie's songs, but I think Dylan, the complexity of Dylan's 
song and the variety of Dylan's song um, across the years that, again, sort of sets him apart. When you sat down to, to write When Dylan Matters, I mean, this is, if, if you'll pardon the expression, this wasn't when you were in your normal day job. I mean, you were known, or you are known as, as, a, as an expert, you're a Harvard professor in, in classical poets. Did you not worry, perhaps, that you wouldn't be taken seriously and this would be, be a, sort of a bit of a, a wacky departure from your perhaps more classical studies? Well, I'm old enough and I think I've done enough um, straight classic stuff to not to worry too much about that. I've also done a couple of articles involving Virgil and Dylan and a Hungarian poet who was killed in the Holocaust, uh, Miklos Radnati, who's writing pastoral poetry in the tradition of Virgil. And, and I connect that to Dylan's song, Not Dark Yet, which is a wonderful melancholic sort of end of the day, it's not dark yet, but it's getting there, the singer sings. And so, you know, this, these songs really sort of come together with the, the poetry that I teach. That poetry has survived 2,000 years, not just because I teach it in Latin, but because it has mattered to readers in, in the same way that Dylan is, is mattering. And that song you started with, what song is as iconic as that from the 60s? Uh, you know, Rolling Stone magazine had the best song of all time. Even though he hasn't sung it, he's just sung it but once the day after the uh, the Nobel Award back in October 2016. So he stopped singing it, uh, but it'll probably come back at some point. Dylan was known, obviously, as, as the folk singer, the Greenwich, uh, the Greenwich Village singer, the protest singer. For those not familiar with the work of the great classicists, is this the sort of thing that they were addressing with... The, I mean, Dylan's addressing all sorts of issues, but, for example, the Vietnam War, the civil rights issue. What, what can you draw as parallels between him in the 60s and then somebody like a, a Homer or a Virgil? Yeah, well, let's take the artist, start with the Odyssey, which Dylan has discovered. I mean, he claims in his Nobel lecture that he it mattered to him way back in school, and I think he probably did read it, but he's been integrating it into his song, and specifically the voice of Odysseus, who's who's seeking homecoming, which he doesn't find, loses his men, eventually finds it at the end of the poem, of course. But I think Dylan, if you think of Dylan on the road, on his own odyssey, I think he's, he's connecting with the voice of Odysseus and directly quoting um, bits from the odyssey and integrating them into his song. This is a part of a, a method of composition that's more recent, really from 2001, Love and Theft, the, the title itself of that album, the theft of other songs, including Virgil, including The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, a Japanese gangster novel, um, and then the next album, 2006, um, Henry Timrod, a southern, southern poet from the mid-19th century. So, yeah, so Dylan... Dylan um, reads and is able to see the poetry in translations of this of this uh, long tradition that that then fit into his new song the protest thing which of course you know he barely did a protest song after the mid 60s but that label stuck just because those songs masters of war blown in the wind i mean no, there's no better anti war song no better civil rights song than those two and they and i think as people felt about the vietnam war so they felt about Dylan, if they were for the war, they simply saw him as a scruffy protest singer, but he's, uh, he went on. I think, um, you know, all of his songs are protesting something about the human condition, about, um, you know, about injustice, inequity, but, you know, lots of song does that. Virgil's eclogues, you know, two shepherds, one going off into exile, losing his farm, which probably reflects the um, confiscation of land from Italian Farmers that happened in the context of the Civil War, Augustus and Mark Antony settling their soldiers on the land of these people that are being dispossessed. So Virgil is writing through the metaphor of shepherd song, but it's quite there's quite clearly a, a political and a, and a protest, if you like, aspect uh, to that. So you know, I think all song is is protesting something. It's a cry of sort of human um, emotion about things being lost, things being taken away. I, I mean, I suppose the thing is that we, 2,000, 3,000 years later, have lost that immediacy, if we don't look closely, 
uh, with with the great poets, with the great classical poets, and 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 so at first sight there wouldn't seem we don't see we just think that there's a bunch of you know excuse my putting it like a like a plebeian, but we just see a bunch of people in togas you know, prancing around on the stage. However, um, you can draw the 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 the, the classic poems uh, of that era as protest songs in their own right or protest work in their own right. Absolutely, and it's my my day job is to bring out the relevance and the modernity of these poets. Um, you know, someone like Catullus's poem for a dead brother, a young brother lost. I mean, it's a beautiful poem. It's mattered through the centuries to people who have read it. And and anyone who loses his brother today is going to find solace and find a connection in that song, as they will in, say, Dylan's Lonesome Day Blues, uh, My Brother Got Killed in a War, you know, is that... We think that's the Vietnam War, but in fact, it's the it's the American Civil War through these allusions to Huck Finn, to the Roman Civil Wars through the allusion to to Virgil, which is quite clear on that song. So yeah, it's um, you know, as I say, those of us who study and teach any literature are going to make connections. And if you have someone like Dylan who's singing the songs that he's sung, these hundreds and hundreds of songs, um, there's a reason that they survive. And I suppose the thing is that we're drawing from this one is personal experience is personal experience. I lost my brother in the war can can refer to any war through the centuries, through the eons. Absolutely. And you note that Dylan in, say, Masters of War or in that song, Lonesome Day Blues, he doesn't specify a time or place. You know, he does in, in some songs he'll mention, you know, Vietnam or First World War, Second World War. Um, but in that song, and I think in the greatest of songs, um, they're universalized by by not being tied to a place and time, uh, and that's true of Virgil's poetry. It's that's true of Homer's poetry um, in many ways. I mean, when yeah. when you when you come to approach something like this, I mean, when I was when I was studying, we you know our, one of our usual texts was Hamlet, obviously Shakespeare's Hamlet, and there are so many different readings you can put into Hamlet that we used to go off on tangents and have you know Hamlet was this and a Hamlet was that and Hamlet was a hamster, you name it. We, we could we could impose our own thoughts on it. What, did, you know, how did you how did you draw that line then without seeming to go off on, on, a, on a slightly weird tangent or were you absolutely rock solid when you, when the Nobel Prize was a reward and you thought, right, now I'm going to, to draw that line, you know, that indelible and effable line between the great poets of, of antiquity and Bob Dylan? Yeah, I'd been drawing them in the seminar since 2004. I teach it every four years. So I started teaching it after, really after 2001, after that song, Lonesome Day Blues, when I heard Virgil on, and I thought, hmm, I'd always, as I say, connected the lyric voice of, of uh, Dylan to poets like Catullus, and, you know, as one can connect them to the poets of the 19th century, Byron, uh, Whitman, obviously. Um, so, that, yeah, everything's part of a stream. It's all connected. So the Nobel Prize was, uh, yeah, was uh, confirmation in my mind of what Dylan is, but I'd, I've been pretty sure in my mind, uh, you know, for some years about what he was. Now, writing the book, that was partly the, um, I was approached, you know, because of the Nobel and because I was teaching it actually on the day of the Nobel announcement. And so that was, uh, if it had been a year later, I probably, um, I might not have uh, written the book, I might not have had the opportunity to, but um, I'd always thought I would write um, a book on Dylan. I, I wasn't sure what it would look like. And this uh, this book, which came together, um, really sort of tells the story we've been talking about. When I interview quite a, a lot of people who have written books, and, and one of the questions that I've all, I always ask, or ask quite on a frequent basis, is I'm really actually looking forward to asking you because of the, the – you'll see why in a minute. Because I always ask them, is there something about the subject that they didn't realise before and they thought, right, got you when they found it? I call it the eureka moment. Did you have a eureka moment um, with the, uh, when you came to write uh, Why Do The Matters? Um, yeah, I had lots of them. One was um, noticing that in 2014, he had um, 2013. Sorry, he did two shows in Rome. The set list had become pretty regular at that point, but in these two shows in Rome, sixth and seventh of November 2013, he suddenly changed the set list and deposited 
if you like, um, all of these great songs, including like a Rolling Stone, except for the one time he sang it uh, after the Nobel, he deposited them in Rome. And Rome's always mattered to him. The streets of Rome are filled with rubble. So when I paint my masterpiece, uh, various other songs, uh, the Rome interview that he gave right before Love and Theft came out in 2001, where he says, you know, there were people walking around in this city, Rome, who are on a much higher level. And then he's writing a song with, with Virgil in it. Virgil, by the way, was a rock star in antiquity. When he entered the theater with Augustus, uh, people stood up and cheered, and not cheering Augustus, but cheered Virgil just because he was he was the meaningful voice of their times as Dylan is of my times or our times. So that was one moment, seeing all of those songs that he essentially left in Rome, including Boots of Spanish Leather, which he wrote while his girlfriend Suze Rotolo was off in Italy. One of the, you know, she partly gave us one of the great songs as she did some of the other songs that Dylan moping around, as it said, in the, in the village in those months um, put together. That's a song that also goes way back, the sort of the duet, the back and forth of it goes right back to poems by the Roman poet Horace and others. So there were another um, eureka moment was when he changed the lyrics in performance around 2010 of Working Man's Blues Number no. 2 and replaced the Arvid, the poet Arvid, who, whose exile poems were in the studio version, replaced that poet with Homer and again with the voice of Odysseus. Um, I'm going to take my spare and shove it halfway through your spine, which is a direct quote of Odysseus telling how he killed a stag. But in the Dylan song, now changed in performance, Dylan essentially becomes Homer. So that, that probably was the culminating moment late in the book where where I heard that a bootleg of that version and thought, hmm, so Dylan's, uh, he's not offered anymore, he's become Homer. And in a way, uh, you know, then the next album, The, the Marvelous Tempest from 2012, in Pay and Blood and Early Roman Kings are direct quotes. Again, we know the translation, it's, it's Robert Fagel's 1996 translation of the Odyssey. So if Dylan is directly quoting that, he, the singer is essentially turning into Odysseus, looking for homecoming, as, as, as I said, uh, Dylan has been doing himself. Fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. Um, any idea if the, if the man himself has seen your book or, or, or read your book? Um, he may have, I think he read a paragraph of it because uh, I know somebody who who did a shot of one page where I talk about Dylan, Dylan's interest in the humanities and everything human. And um, I have reason to believe that he's he may have seen that. His manager, I know his manager pretty well, Jeff Rosen, and and uh, certainly there's an awareness of the book. But I have no no idea and one will never really know you know whether dylan has has read it um if if you you know people who whose interest will have been piqued by this and and will hopefully rush off and get hold of the book or they can they can download it virtually from the talk radio europe virtual bookstore if they wanted to to, to whet their appetites in the cl- dip their toe into and the the poets of antiquity where would you where would you start them richard where would you say they should just you know as as to be led gently into the the myriad voices of of ancient Greece and ancient Rome. Yeah, so the cha- chapters uh, seven, Mature Poet Steel, which is a quote from T.S. Eliot, Virgil Dillon and the Making of a Classic. It's about that song, Lonesome Day Blues, but lo- lots of others. Chapter eight is about modern times and becoming Homer, if you like. So those are late in the book. But even in, in chapter five, I talk about some of the mid-60s songs and the way he's stealing from... Uh, Rambo, the French uh, symbolist poet, and others that's long been known, but you can see that his process of of taking from other texts, the creative reuse of other texts, has really been there from the beginning, and it's what folk music is all about. You know, folk music is traditional, and Dylan, in his uh, Music Care speech a couple of years ago, said, you know, quotes from some folk songs, traditional, and then says, I can imagine somebody singing that, also singing this, and then going into It's All Right Ma or some of his his great original songs. So I think the process of composition, he just naturally came to these classical texts as as part of a 
tradition of coming to various uh, various texts in the folk and other literary tradition that are in the English language. The book is called Why Dylan's Matters. It's published, uh, it's out now by William Collins. It's also available as, as an e-book. You can download it from the, uh, the Talk Radio Europe uh, virtual bookstore as well. It's by Richard F. Thomas. Richard, if people want to, to follow you, or is there a website? Can there, is there a Facebook thing? How can they get in touch with you uh, or get hold of the book or find out some more about this fascinating subject? I think the um, Harvard Classics Department, I think I have a, a website on that. I don't do Twitter uh, yet, but maybe I should. But, um, but yeah, no, I, I have had emails from people and some, some wonderful reactions, and I'm, I've always replied to the emails, so even to the one negative one, but they've all been positive, and, um, and so the book seems to have touched a positive nerve with a number of people, and that's, um, that's what I wanted to to do to share this material with um, those who care about Dylan or those who are curious about Dylan. Um, and um, only begs the question, um, any more thoughts of doing anything else on, uh, on Bob Dylan? Or are you going to uh, get a look and, and keep uh, with the classics for the next four years or so? No, I think I, I have a couple of projects that are not really describable right now, but a couple of Dylan projects that occurred to me in the course of writing the book. So I think I always tell my students to work on things that – are exciting you and since um having from having done the book dylan is exciting me as he has, has always done so i think uh, i think i may keep going for the time being well professor the book is called why dylan matters it's by professor richard thomas it's been a pleasure and a privilege to speak uh, to you today have a very good rest of your friday and a very good weekend well thanks charles and it's been wonderful to speak to you and enjoy spain